As you know, we're in the middle of a series called Tis the Season. And over the last two weeks, we looked at some various things of, of what Jesus saw that first Christmas. We first studied the idea of family, and we realized that Christmas meant people being committed to people inside of a family, that it meant that we had to be committed to faith inside of a family, and that we had to build our families around Jesus just as Mary and Joseph did. And then last week, we looked at our priorities. And what was the priority of Jesus that first Christmas? We remember that he humbled himself, that he laid aside in his titles and all of his royalties so that he could become man, so that he could come to earth, and so that he could defeat sin and the enemy because we couldn't do that. And it was a reminder to us that during this busy time of the season, where we get so distracted with so many other things, that we can never let those other things become more of a priority to us during Christmas than Jesus. Because if Jesus thought it important enough to lay aside everything else to focus on Christmas, then shouldn't we too think it important enough to lay aside everything else to focus on Jesus this Christmas? So today we're going to be looking at another part of this series. And as you probably know, it is Christmas time. It is time to go buy those gifts, wrap those gifts. And for some people, it is time to start thinking about the gifts we're going to be getting. I looked on the, the internet and Amazon.com listed their top 10 most popular items that people are requesting so far this year. Now the first one actually kind of surprised me. Um, the number one top requested item or uh, gift that's being bought on Amazon.com right now is the Kindle Fire. The other top 10s consist of other type of tablet forms like iPads and the Samsung and all those things and the iPod. But it's surprising to me is there's also some cameras here. But what's interesting is with the advent of the internet and with the extension of the Black Friday deals, which I'm not sure if we're still in Black Friday or not, but needless to say, um, it is very easy to buy gifts and find gifts for people this year. And if you talk to people about what the meaning of Christmas is, they will give you different answers. Some people will tell you that the meaning of Christmas has to do with families. Other people will tell you that the meanings of Christmas have to do with traditions. And then you will hear from some people that the meaning of Christmas is about gifts. Personally, that's what I think. I think Christmas is all about gifts. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I think the, 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 the part of family, the get-togethers, is nice, but that's not Christmas. I think the traditions that we have at Christmas are important and they're meaningful. But that's not what Christmas is. Christmas really is about the gift we give and the gift that we get. Now before you gasp at that and say, oh my gosh, he's lost his rocket, let me, let me explain this to you. Christmas was built on and built around one simple gift. And so today, as we've been doing throughout this series, we are going to look through the eyes of Jesus that first Christmas and see what the gifts of Christmas meant to him. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to open up to Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and it's also on your handout if you want to look at that as well. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what, the star, what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when they have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. Verse 9. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, 
till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Lord, we thank you for your word today, Heavenly Father. Lord, I ask that it be your message that flows through my mouth and not my own. Lord, I pray that we stay focused, we stay humble, we stay committed to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before we kind of get to the bottom part of that scripture, beginning in verse 9, let me give you a little background on what's going on here. We talk about Herod the king, and actually I slipped and I called him Herod the Great, because that's actually what he was known as, Herod the Great. And this Herod was actually the first of four Herods that we find in the New Testament. He was actually kind of the founder of the Herod's part. But this man was not a nice man. He was actually known to be very brutal and decisive. He actually had two of his sons executed by strangulation for plotting against him. His oldest son, the one that was supposed to be his heir, tried to poison him, so he actually had him in prison and put in chains. And it was this time, actually, shortly before his death, he was older. You would think that he would become more mellow, but he wasn't. He was still as aggressive, he was still as evil as he ever had. In fact, what he called the people to do, he knew that his death was coming. He called his people to gather all of the Jewish leaders in the city, and he told them, the moment that I die, I want you to execute all of them. Because I don't want there to be any rejoicing at the time of my death. I want there to be mourning. So this is the kind of man who is called the wise man. And he tells them, tell me where the king is because I want to be able to go out and worship him. Now we have the hindsight of knowing the guy is just giving it lip service. This man was very threatened by people who thought he would want, they would want to take over his, his reign. So when the wise men come to him and say, tell us about this king, he immediately begins to think rival. And as he begins to think rival, he immediately begins to think, I must kill him. So this is the Herod that we're dealing with in this scripture. But then we look at the wise men. You know, the, the wise men have always been kind of the intriguing part of this story. We don't know much about them. We know they followed a strange star to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. Now, we sometimes call them wise men, wise men, and sometimes we call them magi. Now, the magi were people that were almost like astrologers, astronomers. So it would make sense that they would follow a star because that's kind of what they would be focused on. There's been a lot of discussion as to how many wise men or magi actually came to see Jesus. We, we usually think it was three because there were three gifts. But what we don't understand or what we don't realize is that these men were wealthy, these men were scholars, these men were highly regarded in their own communities. So it would be very unlikely that there would only be three men of such stature carrying very valuable and prized possessions that would go a long distance to worship a, a, a child. So probably more likely than not, these three men came with a group of people that helped them on their journey, but also protected them on their journey as well. And these men of importance brought gifts, valuable gifts to a child that they knew nothing about. And what's interesting is we read the scripture that while this child was very young, this child was already, we were already beginning to see things happen in relation to him. The wise men were seeking him. Herod was opposing him. And already we know that the Jewish leaders were ignoring him. The moment that Jesus came into that town, it's safe to say that that town was never the same. The moment that Jesus came into this world, it's safe to say that this world was never the same. So last week we were in Luke, and we talked about his birth, and here we are in Matthew chapter 2. Now, we have to understand that some things, have, some time has elapsed since Luke to Matthew. 
We kind of always assume that, you know, the wise men saw Jesus in the manger. You know, those are the pictures that we have. It's, it's the donkey, it's the parents, it's the hay, and it's the wise men. But as we read in Matthew today, that isn't necessarily the case. You see, now though maybe not all scholars will agree upon the timing of when the wise men came to uh, see Jesus, we do know a couple things. We know when Luke talks about the birth of Jesus, it mentions a manger where he was born. But yet in Matthew chapter 2 today, we realize, we read that Mary and Joseph, although they were still in Bethlehem, they're now in a house. We know in Luke that we refer to this, this Jesus, I said this baby, Jesus as a baby. But here in Matthew 2, Matthew refers to him as a child. And there's also another interesting component of this. You see, remember, Herod is not real happy about whoever this little king is being in his territory. So he asked the wise men a simple thing. He says, when was it that you saw the star appear? Because he's trying to calculate how old this child could be. Now we read in Matthew 2, verse 16, it says, And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So obviously the wise men must have told him that it was about two years ago when we saw the star, and ever since then we have been following him. And that's why Herod made the decree that all males two years and younger would be executed, because he thought by doing that he would be able to take care of this king wherever he was. So those are all indications for us that the baby was no longer a baby, but he was now a child. And you may wonder, well, why on earth did it take the wise men two years in order to find the child? Now, some of you say, well, they were men, so they probably didn't ask for directions and they got lost a lot. Or they were men and they procrastinated a lot and, you know, they didn't want to get going until the end. Well, more than likely, we know that these wise men traveled a long period of time in order to find the child, Jesus. In fact, it's safe to say that they may have traveled as far as a thousand miles to come see him. It's assumed that they were originally from the territory, the region where Iraq would be right now. So no, I don't think that they delayed in order to go see this child. But I think they came a long way in order to see this child. Their search was long, but they stayed diligent. They were determined to search until they found the answer to the question, who is this child? Did they grow tired? Probably so. Did they get sick? Most likely. Did they get discouraged? Did they feel like quitting? Probably yes. But one of the things we learned from these wise men is that they persevered and wouldn't let anything get in the way. You see, in their eyes, Christmas is about a, a gift worth waiting for. Christmas was about a gift worth waiting for. In their trek for this gift, did they allow themselves to be sidetracked, discouraged, distracted, frustrated, defeated? No. They were wise men, adults, wealthy enough to invest two years of their lives in search for this child, the Messiah. They knew that the child they were making the sacrifice for was worth the wait and was worth the cost. And we have to ask ourselves today, do we see this child, our Savior, worth the wait and worth the cost in our own lives? Is Jesus this gift one that we are willing to sacrifice for, work for, stay committed to, just like the wise men. And it was because of the wise men and their commitment and diligence to find this child, we get the idea of Christmas gifts. You see, because the wise men started it all. And what I'm talking about is they started the idea and the concept of giving gifts to Jesus at Christmas time. 
They taught us not only to give gifts, but they taught us how the way we should give gifts to Jesus. We learned that the wise men gave their gifts personally to Jesus. Again, understand, they were wealthy men. They were highly respected <coughs> men. They lived a far ways away. They could have easily hired servants to deliver their gifts to Jesus. But they thought him worthy enough to deliver these gifts personally to him. But they also teach us that we must give our gifts to Jesus in the proper manner. See, what's interesting about the story of the wise men, we get so distracted by the gifts that they gave, but it's not really the gifts that were important that day. It was how they gave their gifts. Yes, gold, frankincense, and myrrh are very valuable, very precious. But that wasn't what was important to Jesus. Jesus didn't look at the gifts. He knew what the gifts were. He knew what the gifts meant. Jesus looked at the way that they gave those gifts to them. And we see that in verse 9, or excuse me, verse 11. When it says, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These wise men had traveled a long way for a long time, endured many different conditions, endured dangers, endured sickness to give their gifts to this child. But before they gave their gifts to this child, what did they do? We read in verse 11 that they bowed down and they worshiped the child. You see, the wise men teach us that Christmas is about a gift worth giving. Christmas is about a gift worth giving. Now, yes, they specifically mentioned three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And yes, you will hear pastors give sermons on what those mean. Gold was a gift worthy of his, lord, his uh, lordship. It was a gift that was given to royalty. This child, Jesus, deserved the very best. And this is what these three men gave to him. But the gold also talked of his authority, his title. Remember in Revelation 19.6, he was called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Frankincense was a gift worthy of his holiness. Yes, he is Lord. But as we read in Isaiah 43, he is also holy. Verse 15 says, I am the Lord, your Holy One. Frankincense was something that was used in prayer and in worship. And in frankincense, we get the image of the, the worship of Christ, the Holy One. And then there was myrrh, a gift worthy of his sacrifice. Myrrh was used as a vital part of death and burial, as part of the embalming process. Myrrh represented the pain that Jesus would endure at the end of his life to end the suffering in our life. Probably nobody knew the significance of these three gifts that day. Not the wise men, not his parents. But I'm sure that Jesus did. We read of myrrh in uh, John 19, verse 39, where it says that they brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury it. But even though they, these men gave Jesus these three gifts that would foretell of his life, that he would be Lord, he would be someone we should worship, and he would be someone that would suffer. It wasn't those three gifts that impressed Jesus that Christmas. But it was how the wise men gave those gifts that impressed Jesus that Christmas. You see, before they presented the gifts to Jesus, they presented themselves to Jesus. They fell down. They worshipped Him. 
And what's interesting is we don't read in the Bible that they gave the same type of welcoming to Herod the king. So these men, although they were not Jewish, they were Gentiles. These men knew this child was different. These men knew that these gifts were different. The way that they approached this child was the way that they would approach a special king, a special God. And that was the gift that Christmas that made the most impact on Jesus. And that is the gift that this Christmas that Jesus wants from us. You see, isn't it interesting that these three wealthy men gave him these valuable gifts? And it's a reminder to us that the, thing that, the things that God blesses us with, we must in turn use to honor Him. But these three men came to worship Him. And the question we have today is, can we give to the one who saved us the same thing? Truly the only thing that He wants this Christmas. Can we trust Him with our soul? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John tells us that if we give Him our soul, we will receive the gift that He has made available to us. But it also says that can we trust Him with our lives? Paul wrote to, writes in Romans 12 that, that we are to be a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God. The greatest gift that we can give Jesus this Christmas has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with material things. The one thing that Jesus wants this Christmas, the one thing that He doesn't have is our hearts. What are you going to give Christmas this year? Why not consider giving yourself? This Christmas, why don't you make time for your family? Why don't you show compassion to the hurting? Why don't you bring love and joy to the isolated? And why don't you give your heart to Jesus? The greatest gift that we can give this Christmas. And guys, if you want to come on up here. Now, church, if I asked you, what makes a Christmas gift special to you? Now, some of you may say, well, the more expensive the gift is, the better. Some may say, well, whether they bought the gift is important to me. And yes, those may be factors in it. But, but, but here's what I think makes a Christmas gift special. A Christmas gift is special when we know that the person that gave us the gift took time to pick out a gift. The thing that makes a Christmas gift special to me is when we know that that person knew something about us to know that we would want that gift. Maybe they listened to us. Maybe they got to know us. Maybe they know that this was the one gift that we absolutely wanted. Well, church, this perfectly describes the gift that God gave to us that first Christmas. God thought long and hard about the perfect gift that He could give you. God cared enough to give you this special gift. You see, at the end of the day, Christmas is about a gift worth receiving, and that's Jesus. Christmas is about a gift worth receiving, that's Jesus. And what makes this gift so special to us? Well, Matthew told us a chapter before that this gift, this child, Jesus, would come to save us from our sins. When God sent Jesus to this earth to die for our sins, 
what he was telling us was that he knew us. He knew more about our hearts than we ever would. He knew both the good parts and he knew the bad parts. And he knew that we were worthy of such a valuable and precious gift. You guys, if you want to bring up the communion. Church, if Christmas is about anything, Christmas is about a gift. A gift that came to us in the form of a son, a king, a savior, a Christ. If you think about it, Jesus is the perfect gift. He was expensive for God to give, but he's easy for us to receive. And he truly is the gift that keeps on giving. He's a gift that we can give to everybody all around us. Our family, our friends, our communities. He is a gift of time and intimacy and celebration and relationship. And he is a gift that will always meet your needs and fulfill your deepest desires. Now we talk about truly giving God something, giving this Jesus, this baby, a gift in return. And here's why I did something different this, this month, and we didn't do communion the first of the month. Because as we talk about giving Him a gift back today, there's no better time or place than in communion. Now church, so often when churches do communions and when we do communion, we just get so caught up in that, here's the bread, here's the wine, take it, we're good. But we don't spend time really understanding the gift that we have in our hands. And we really don't spend time understanding the gift that Jesus wants in return. You see, Jesus gave up everything so that he could come in the form of a baby to one day die for our sins. And Jesus asked one thing in return. I want you. You're the reason why I came. You're the reason why I endured that pain. So before we take communion today, here's what we need to do, church. I want us to really spend time thinking about what this gift means. I want us to really spend time offering our gifts back to Jesus. See, the Bible says that before we go into communion, we need to kind of get rid of all of our stuff. We need to confess our sins to God. We need to ask for repentance. So many times we don't do that. Unfortunately for a lot of churches and a lot of people, communion has become a ritual. But communion really should be about a relationship. Jesus came to make us whole. Jesus came to make us clean. Jesus came to make us pure. And I believe that before we can truly receive this gift from Him, we must do the same back to So church, I don't want you to rush in, in, in having the communion. I want you to spend time and I want you to be honest with God. I want you to spend time and I want you to talk to Him. I want you to offer up that sin in your life and ask for forgiveness and repentance. I want you to offer up all those ill feelings that we harbor towards people. And ask God for forgiveness. We must, at a time of communion, do as the wise men. We must humbly fall before our God. 
We must worship Him. We must honor Him. We must glorify Him in the right way. Church, we must really understand what this gift is all about. And we must really understand what our gift to Him is all about. So as the worship band plays in the background, I want you to spend time today with Him. I want you to be honest with Him about stuff. Because what I found in my life, church, big shock, He already knows. But what He needed for me was to truly repent. He needed for me to be honest about stuff. He needed for me to cry out and say I'm broken. He needed for me to say I'm a wreck, I'm a mess. I want you to spend time with him this morning. I want you to offer up your sin to him and ask for forgiveness. I want you to offer up your hearts to Him and say, take it. There's no greater gift than what we can give Him right now. 